Welcome to Podcasts on Demand, a continuing medical education activity. This activity includes the most recent and current clinical data presented by leading experts. If you are seeking continuing education credit, please review the disclosures and the requirements for a successful completion of the activity prior to listening to the podcast. A link is found in the podcast description that can direct you to this information. Thank you for joining us for Conversations in Advanced Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer, Rationale and Utility of Trope 2 Antibody Drug Conjugate Based on Updates from WCLC and ESMO. During this segment, we will be discussing the rationale of ADCs targeting Trope 2 and other novel targets. I'm Dr. Benjamin Levy, and I'm Associate Professor of Oncology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Aaron Lisberg and Dr. Alexander Spira. Guys, welcome. Thank you. So let's start out just creating a little bit of a framework here when we start talking about the ADCs. You know, we've come a long way in the field of non-small cell lung cancer with the advent of targeted therapies, the development of immunotherapies, um, and we really begin to push the envelope, I think, in the first line. Uh, again, with immunotherapy coming first, targeted therapies coming first. But a lot of challenges in the second line. Alex, you want to talk a little bit about some of the unmet needs, specifically for those patients without actionable alterations in the second line? Sure. No, happy to, Ben. So I think as I look at it, you know, we've made a lot of headway over the last five years in particular, especially since I started 20 years ago in terms of what we have to treat. Um, you know, immunotherapy has revolutionized the care of oncology patients in the frontline setting with most, a lot of, with most patients getting uh, chemo uh, immunotherapy right now in their frontline treatment. And certainly also just looking at chemotherapy with the use of pemetrexid, which has been a very well tolerated drug, really moved us far along. And again, I remember the days when we were giving two drugs with taxanes, which we still do for squamous and it was tough. The challenge is in the second line setting. We really haven't made much headway, and we're kind of in this status quo for quite some time with a standard of care. The only thing really present on the NCCN guidelines in the second line of therapy is docetaxel. And we all struggle with that because while it's an okay drug, it's only okay. Response rates, plus or minus ramaserumab, are in the 20% range. Pretty tough tolerated drug. I will go out on the limb. I'm sure you will agree with me that when people are on clinical trials, they do a little bit better, but the real world, it's a very tough drug. Side effects, alopecia, your nail changes, serositis, very tough to dr drug to give, very limited benefits. So we need to make an improvement for these patients, especially without actionable mutations. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot more actionable mutation than KRAS G12C was the big one from a few years back, but for most of our patients, they still don't have anything beyond that. So trying to get better. Uh, well summarized. Aaron, do you share Alex's pain with the docetaxel? Are there ways to get patients through docetaxel, dose reductions? Are you doing anything other than docetaxel in the second line off of a clinical trial? Yeah, I think those are great questions. And I, I do agree with everything that Alex said. You know, docetaxel is a difficult drug to use. I found it easier to use with uh, weekly dosing. Um, I think that that is better tolerated. And certainly some patients, they can tolerate ramaserumab. That is a uh, reasonable um, adjunct therapy to give with the docetaxel. But in general, I continue to feel it's a, a difficult drug to give. I've seen benefit in some patients, but as Alex said, you know, response rates in the low 20%, uh, we're really hoping to do better for our patients. Yeah, I think the bar is relatively low right now and we need to do better. Um, we've got all these wonderful therapies like immunotherapy and targeted therapies that we're able to start our patients off on on their journey. Unfortunately, we know that most of our patients will develop disease progression, and we are desperate for, for novel second-line therapies, and that probably sets the foundation for antibody drug conjugates or the ADCs, um, what I call the new kids on the block for non-small cell lung cancer. They're probably the newest class of drugs uh, that we're beginning to look at, evaluate, and, and, and leverage in our clinical trials, hopefully in routine clinical care soon. Um, just a 10,000 foot overview of ADCs. Of course, you have the monoclonal antibody, which should have this high affinity and avidity for the target antigen, uh, be able to, to conjugate with the linker that can then conjugate with the, the payload. So the antibody can be chimeric or humanized, it's usually humanized now. Um, and then of course the linker, which can be both either, excuse me, cleavable or non-cleavable. And we can kind of talk a little bit about that but the bottom line is, is non-cleavable needs that lysosomal degradation to disassociate the monoclonal antibody from 
uh, from the payload. And, uh, and then the cleavable ones, which are a little bit more flexible in, in their ability to uh, disassociate the payload from the monoclonal antibody, uh, don't necessarily just, not just restricted to lysosomal degradation. Um, again, most mono, uh, ADCs are now using these cleavable linkers. Then you have the payload, uh, and, and we, I think, just beginning to scratch the surface on these payloads. We have microtubule inhibitors, DNA damaging agents, tocari summarize one inhibitors. Um, clearly, the payload also has to be amenable to the linker attachment. This all comes down to, to synthetic biochemistry, the development of these drugs. I mean, it really is uh, the, the conjugation, the chemical bonds that occur are really important. Um, Aaron, I'll start with you. Are these drugs chemotherapy 2.0 or are they targeted therapy? What are these drugs? Yeah, I think that's a loaded question. So I will answer it in a nuanced manner. Um, but I think that you have really laid the kind of spectrum in terms of where we can respond here. And, you know, in terms of mechanism of action, as you very nicely um, described uh, just now, uh, they are chemotherapy agents uh, in terms of how they're the end, uh, the end results of their actions. Uh, but then, you know, are they targeted or are they targeted therapy? I don't know if we can explicitly say that. The way I like to describe this uh, to my patients specifically, because that's where these conversations are usually occurring, is it's more of a directed uh, chemotherapy. We uh, understand that, as you described, that these drugs really only become active when they engage uh, with the tumor cell expression of the target of the antibody drug conjugate. Then once this drug is brought inside that tumor cell, essentially they become active. So it's more of a directed chemotherapy is how I like to describe it at this point. Um, but I still think it is, you know, at, at the end of the day, a, a chemotherapy like um, action that's occurring and leading to the tumor cell death. Uh, Alex, your thoughts. I'll ask another loaded question here. Is the efficacy, efficacy of these drugs linked to the target engagement of the monoclonal antibody? Or is it really just all about the payload and the chemotherapy that's linked to that ADC? Yes, both, I think. <laughs> uh, so I think you're getting to it. You're hitting, that, you're hitting the uh, target on the cell, right? So if the tumor cells are overexpressing it, but you're also using the payload as well, right? And that's going in and having cytotoxic effect. Uh, I'll echo exactly what Aaron says, but I heard a great analogy. I call it chemo on a stick. So it's very targeted therapy, but you still get, you know, the challenge is the off-target effects. If these are working perfect, you wouldn't have any major toxicity, right? But if you look at many of these, and we're going to talk about this, Today, you know, we do see some chemotherapy-like side effects. In high enough doses, you get cytopenias. Um, some of them, for example, things that are conjugated to SM38, which is a renotecan, you get diarrhea-like side effects. You do get alopecia. So in this world of having something that's supposed to be perfect and is only going to the tumor, we still have to watch out for the off-target effects, which can be real. Yeah, and just, you know, the mechanism of action of these drugs, I think we're still tr still trying to wrestle with. Of course, we talk about target engagement of the antibody, release of the warhead. Aaron, we'll talk about just a little bit about bystander effect, what that's all about with these ADCs. Of course. Yeah, I think that's a very important concept. And, you know, it's known to be associated with efficacy and the, and the direct link maybe isn't as clear. But in terms of the bystander effect, essentially, um, that is the ability for the payload to diffuse through the plasma membrane of a tumor cell to neighboring tumor cells. And the idea there is likely that there may be heterogeneous um, expression of the target. And so you can imagine within a tumor mass that some of the cells may express the target that this, that this ADC is design, designed against and some may not. And the idea being that once the um, antibody drug conjugate engages with uh, the tumor uh, expression on those cells that do express the target, the payload is uh, incorporated into the tumor cell and then it can diffuse through plasma membrane to neighboring cells. Maybe that they don't, don't express it or allowing for those neighboring cells to die as well. So I think that's an important concept. Uh, this um, diffusion through the plasma membrane and the bystander effect in terms of the efficacy of these drugs. Yeah, well stated. And just to add to that, I think we, we're also thinking that maybe these drugs work through ADCC or antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Maybe there's an immunotherapy effect here where the monoclonal antibody binds to the antigen and then engage, engages the, the immune cells to, to come in and, and, and be recruited uh, to, to the tumor. So a lot of things we're still learning about. Alex, you know, there's a lot of targets out there uh, for ADCCs. There's HER2, there's HER3, there's MET, and then there's TROPE2. Uh, you know, what is the rationale here for TROPE2? I mean, we, we've learned about HER2, maybe mutations and their ability, patients that have HER2 mutations predicting efficacy to trastuzumab, deruxtecan. 
Um, but trope two is sort of unwinding on us a little bit, um, learning about its biological relevance. What, any any take on trope two expression in lung cancer and what it means? Sure, and I kind of use the analogy, you know, the breast cancer world's a little bit ahead of us, sadly, on this one. But if you look at trastuzumab, deruxtecan, breast cancer, you know, they first got it approved for very high levels of expression. But now they have, as we all know, great data down to patients who are one plus. Right. So if you look at the patient population, it's huge. And think about that. You just need a little bit. So I kind of lump it into two things. Right. So if you look at things like HER2, HER2 when you have HER2 mutations, this clearly these tumor cells are expressing HER2, but they're mutated and they act as a driver. But now you're looking at something that's just being expressed on the tumor cell. And all you're hoping for in that matter is that it's hopefully more expressed in tumor cells than it is on benign cells. And you can use it as a target or as, you know, if you're thinking about this as a warhead, as a homing device, right? So you're homing it to anything expressing um, trope two. The challenge in trope two, as we'll talk about, is how do you figure out expression, right? If you could figure out which, you know, where cutoffs are and to express things, you could pick out which patients are going to benefit and which patients do not. Great getting an actual biomarker. We're not there yet for trope two. That's how I kind of look at it in general. Trope two is expressed on many tumor cells, uh, bladder, breast, GI, uh, prostate even. The studies are ongoing in these PAM tumor studies right now. Focusing on lung cancer right now, we know that it's very much overexpressed in, in non-small cell lung cancer, hence made it right to start doing studies with these trope two ADCs. Yeah, Aaron, you you will talk about you you led Tropion Lung O One, uh, looking at data put amount versus uh, dose attack. So we'll talk about that later. But just any other additional thoughts you have on Trope Two, uh, which will kind of lead us into the biomarker question for all these ADCs. But any additional insights about Trope Two and its relevance in non-small cell lung cancer? Do we see it more commonly in squamous cell? Is it more common in non-squamous? Uh, does it is it going to be a bona fide biomarker for us? Yeah. Yeah, those are all good questions, and I'll kind of piggyback on what Alex just said. So, you know, there's a lot of um, retrospective analyses that have looked at the expression of trope 2 in non-small cell lung cancer, and it's very high. You know, some data suggests that 100% of adenocarcinoma uh, lung cancers express trope 2, whereas maybe the number in squamous is 92%, which essentially means that essentially across the spectrum we're seeing expression. Now, in terms of high expression, maybe the numbers are lower, about two-thirds of cells, um, but we do have data from the phase one trial looking at our non-small cell lung cancer patients treated with data DXD, the, the uh, TROP2 agent. And we're really not seeing a clear correlation between TROP2 expression on the tumor cell surface and response. So at this point, certainly that is not an appropriate biomarker and it was not an inclusion factor for the trials. Patients were enrolled irrespective of their TROP2 um, expression level. Importantly, the trials were designed with uh, pre-treatment biopsies, oftentimes on treatment biopsies, and sometimes even post-treatment biopsies to help us move this question forward and identify a more clear biomarker. But at this time, I think we have to uh, accept the idea that trope 2 is expressed by the vast majority of non-small cell lung cancers and that the specific expression uh, is not clearly correlated with response. Great answer. So I don't, Alex Spire, I don't get it. Uh, if these ADCs target the antigen on the cell surface, it would seem like the more antigen you have, i.e. high expression, the more likely are these drugs to work. But we're not seeing that. So this gets down to the final part of this segment here, which is all, you know, just a broad discussion about biomarkers and the unfair question to you, which is why doesn't overexpression of a protein thus far predict efficacy to these drugs? We've not only seen this with the Excuse me. With yes, with trastuzumab, deruxtecan, and HER2 overexpressed, we've seen that um, HER3 expression doesn't seem to matter for pitrutumab, deruxtecan. We've seen that trope 2 overexpression doesn't matter for datapotumab, deruxtecan. What gives? Um, do you have any good explanations for this as, as to why this is happening? And if IHC is not the biomarker, where should we go here? Gee, Ben, give me an easier question there. Uh, people have been trying to figure this out for a long time. So I think number one is, you know, you struggle just in developing a biomarker assay, right? I mean, you, you have to laugh a little bit. You know, what we look at in HER2 in her for breast cancer is one plus, two plus, three plus. And yeah, while there's good ways of designing that, I mean, that's essentially a pathologist looking at is a little, a medium, or a lot. And I know that's in a way of understating it, but that's not a very good way of doing things. You know, we're all scientists here. We like to think in numbers and percentages and cutoffs and what to do and fish testing and copy numbers. That's literally eyeballs. 
So that already tells you that looking at these IHC assays is not very good. Is this just a function of the assay, right? Are we just not able to do the assay due to expression and the reagents that we're using, right? I mean, not everything is amenable to an assay. Or does it have something more than that? Is it density of the trope 2 on the cells? Is it two of them sitting next to each other? What does it mean to be overexpressed? I don't think there's a good answer to that. And I, the reason I get an easy answer to this is there's been a lot of minds smarter than me. Since trope 2 was being studied, since these ADCs first came into clinical trial use a few years ago, everybody's been trying really hard and nobody understands it. Nobody understands what to come, how to build a better mousetrap right now, unfortunately. Great answer. Uh, that's probably the best answer I've heard from you in a long time. Not that you don't give good answers, you do, but that was really, really tight and succinct and I, and I liked it. I think, again, we just don't have a real understanding of this. And um, uh, we need more work in this space to define who's gonna respond and not only that, how to predict toxicity. Um, so thank you again for joining us for this segment on the rationale for ADCs targeting trope 2 and other novel targets in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Please be sure to click on the landing page for this activity to claim your continuing education credit, access supplemental slides, as well as other topic segments. We hope you found this podcast useful and educational. To receive continuing education credit and to download your printable certificate, please go to the activity page at practice.cme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit.